title that I have got, um, I've been given, is How to Tell Your Story. So put your hand up if you've got a totally mind-bending, awesome story of journeying with God that when people um, listen to it, they're kind of like, whoa, I wish I had what you've got. Okay. (laughs) The thing is, is that actually, when you hear that idea, telling your own story, I wonder if you've ever had story envy. Do you know what I mean? Where you hear somebody's story of salvation or coming to God or something or other, and you think, wow, if I could have that story and I could tell that, then the people around me, would they would get it. Do you know what I'm talking about? And I always had that. When I was growing up, I used to think, oh, if only I could have this kind of before and after thing. In my early 20s, I was thinking, maybe I should have had this major rebellion and gone and done some really awful things so I could come and say, you know, it was amazing. When I came back to God, it was such a transformation. But I didn't. I kind of grew up in a Christian home and... My mum was a a woman of faith. She had a very deep and very practical faith. And I watched her pray and read the Bible and pray for other people a lot. And and I kind of, I just thought, yeah. I just always thought, yeah. I never didn't believe in God. I didn't really, I haven't got a before and after. And, And as I was growing up, I sort of, I could, you know, I would listen every now and again to stories of great conversions and think, oh, you know. There's something not that exciting about it. As I've become more and more adult, (laughs) um, I feel like I have grown in appreciation of that upbringing (laughs) so much, particularly as I've shared and prayed with people. One of the things that I do a lot of the time in my life is meeting up with people for prayer and and things like that, and I, um, and trying to unravel some of the things that have happened to us that have maybe maybe changed us and kind of, and um, scarred us, or shaped our journey with God. And it can be quite a challenge yeah. to overcome some of those things. And I have got this deep appreciation of having been held by the love of God since I was a tiny child and being conscious of the grip of God's love on my life that my mum introduced me to and I really do get that it's really good to have had that all these years Um, and that is my story not very dramatic but it's really important to me that I have um, began, uh, I have known to be to look back and say I can see the pattern of God working through my life through all the seasons of my life all since I was a tiny child and it has shaped and formed me and that is a really good thing. <laughs> so, but there, you know, there's so many different stories out there. I've got a friend who called Grace who who one day was walking past the cafe in Stokes Croft. So I'm part as well as being part of the leadership of Woodlands. I'm part of a, a small church plant in Stokes Croft and we have a little cafe down there and sometimes we put music things on and people come in and come and go and and things happen in there and uh, one day this this young lady Grace was walking past she was severely anorexic almost at the point of death and um, you some of you might have seen her baptism testimony on the Woodlands main Woodlands website but that day she just heard a song and it just sounded lovely and she was in a desperate place, and she just got drawn in. And it was a friend of ours called um, Lily who was, who was singing. And at the end, she just talked to Lily, and it was, they just had this connection. And from that day, Grace was introduced to God. And now she is leaving her anorexia behind. She's been baptized. This was totally new to her, and her life is transforming. And I'm in a lot of contact with her, and it's amazing to see the absolute transformation. She literally looks like she's gone from death to life, which is a very visible demonstration of what God can do in a person's life. So stories go from one extreme to the other. And I wonder what your story is and how confident you feel about sharing what God has done in your life and whether you're able to kind of spot the things in your own story that are worth sharing that can actually help other people because the truth is is that our stories are very powerful and your story could actually unlock somebody else's story that could unlock their victory it could unlock hope for them 
So becoming people who are happy to share our stories, even if they're mild like mine, is really worth doing. The word testimony, in the, one of the Old Testament words for testimony is hood, spelt U-W-D. And that word actually, it comes from, its root word means to do it again. So one of the meanings of testimony, storytelling, is about saying, this is something that could be done again. This is something that could be repeated. My story could be your story. And if we withhold our story, then there's a sense in which, you know, there's something withheld from people that God could work through to repeat what he's been doing. Let me just tell you three things before we go and listen to a reading from, or we're going to read something from John chapter 9, a story that has been told over the centuries so many times. Let me just say these three things. This is what I believe about us as people of God, people who are followers of Jesus. One is that if you are a follower of Jesus, you have the whole kingdom of God within you. That's what Jesus said. Now, I don't know what you think the kingdom of God looks like, but I'm sure you think it looks like more than just little you. (laughs) It looks like power. It looks like freedom. It looks like transformation, doesn't it? The kingdom, Jesus said, is within you. And that kingdom is somehow sort of in you for the world. You are its living embodiment and representative. That's quite an amazing idea, isn't it? It's kind of like in your flesh is this extraordinary kingdom and reality. The second thing I think about that is that it's all that because you've got a kingdom in you, it means that there is a constant pressure inwardly towards your own transformation. It cannot be just a still passive thing. Transformation is part of the kingdom. There's like this insistent inner pressure from the Holy Spirit who daily attends to us towards transformation. That's a living reality of being a follower of Jesus. The third thing is that when trouble comes for somebody who's a follower of Jesus, that is not the time when the kingdom just dissipates and you find that it doesn't, it fails you. It is actually an opportunity for a strengthening of your faith and the power of the kingdom within you. That is an extraordinary thing, and a perspective that is really worth meditating on. The kingdom is within you. It's all about transformation, and trouble makes it stronger, not weaker. So, let's listen to this story of Jesus healing the blind man. Now, it's a long old story, and I've picked out... um, some bits of it so that we can get the whole story and I'm going to read to it but I really would recommend you going and just reading it when you get home and read the whole chapter because it is it is an interesting story and it is full of um you know fascinating bits of theology so let's just read these um this so we come in at this point when Jesus has um had a conversation with some people who pointed out to him a blind man And they've said to him, Jesus, why is this man blind? Was it because he did something wrong? Or is it because his parents did something wrong? And Jesus won't get drawn into this theological thing because here is a person in front of him. And he just he just he moves away from that little discussion. And he says this, he says, While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was, and others said, no, it only looks like him. But he himself said, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. He said, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. The Pharisees, who were the kind of religious ruling elite of the day, said to him, asked him also how he'd received his sight. 
And he said, he put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. So you weren't supposed to heal or do anything very much on the Sabbath, not even pick up a feather. There was a law against it. But others said, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. They sent for the man's parents. (laughs) Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he can now see? We know he's our son, the parents answered. We know he was born blind, but how he can see, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he's of age, he will speak for himself. A second time, they summoned the man who'd been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner, Jesus. The man replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind but now I see. Carrying on. Nobody has ever, this is the man speaking, nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind, he said. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so I can believe in him. Jesus said, you've now seen him with your own eyes, of course. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. It is such a fascinating story, isn't it? I think it reads like an episode of EastEnders or something. It's kind of like the parents are there and the Pharisees are there and the man's there. There's the neighbours. You know, it's really evident that these neighbours don't quite recognise him as now he's seeing. And it's as if maybe I, it left me wondering, had they not really seen him before? He'd been a bit of the invisible one, you know, begging by the side of the street, blind. And when they saw him seeing and up and about, they suddenly just re- thought, who are, is it, do I recognize you? You know, it's a bit of a puzzle, isn't it? So in this story, there's the neighbors asking these questions. How did this happen to you? And they ask this question, where is the person who did it? And the man doesn't even know. It's such a funny experience because actually the man has had this mud put on his eyes. You've got to imagine it, really. Here is a man who is blind, and suddenly somebody starts pushing mud into his eyes. You know, there's no real preliminary. It's kind of like Jesus saying, I'm the light of the world. Then he puts the mud into his eyes, and he just says, go and wash in the pool. Now, he's still blind, And you can imagine, I don't know how far from this moment to the pool it was, but he's going down some street or two, isn't he? With mud in his face, going to the pool. Why? What's he thinking? What's going on there? You know, he's some kind of faith has to have been in operation in the man that he would go at the instruction of a stranger who puts mud in his eyes. And he goes and he has this extraordinary private little moment when he must have washed the water from his eyes and thought, I can see. And he was born blind. So he's seeing for the first time in his entire life. So that's one aspect of it that's quite strange in the story. And then the other aspect is stra- the strange is this thing about the neighbours that, you know, they, they're all talking about it and they're puzzled. And, you know, stories of the kingdom should puzzle people. They shouldn't be just without any mystery. I think they should be provocative. And ultimately, the stories of our lives should lead people saying, where is he, this person who did this to you? This should be one of the things that should be provoked in the conversations around him around us as we start to tell our stories the parents it's interesting these parents they kind of like go and ask him do you know why the reason why is because the jewish people who were asking him had said officially if you say that you're a follower of jesus and you believe who he is then you'll be thrown out of the synagogue now that was a major deal in that day was to be thrown out it was like being an outcast in society So the parents had this little moment, really, of, oh, you know, this is crunch time. I I don't want anything to do with it. Because this story was provocative. 
It was actually going to cause, it actually started to cause a bit of division and fear and anxiety. Can I go with this? Because actually if I do, it's going to change everything. It might even change my standing in society. So they had a bit of a moment there, didn't they? And they just said, go and ask him. And then you've got this religious ruling elite who just are so pushy, aren't they? You know, who did it? He couldn't possibly a good, be a good man because he's healing on the Sabbath. You know, they're really pushing it. But... You know, this man, he does something. He cuts through it all, doesn't he? And he just says, I don't know. I don't know if he's a sinner or not. All I know is that I was blind and now I can see. And there's something really powerful about a story that where you have had an encounter with God, whatever the story is, whether it's a healing And it isn't always a healing. Sometimes it is a moment with God where you feel like the truth of who God is and what he says about you just gets down inside you and you start to realize this truth is powerful. And let me say to you, no one can take that from you. It doesn't matter what people think. If they feel like your testimony is going to cause division, that maybe you might even feel a bit outcast in your workplace or in your family. When I was preparing for this, I felt like there might be somebody here who's actually been in conflict in their family because of their own story. And it, it, the trouble is, is that it, our stories can be provocative in that way. But this man cuts through it all and he says, when it comes down to it, this has happened to me and I'm, not, I'm owning it. I'm not going to lose it. Because no one can take your testimony from you. And even the ruling elite, you know, in some ways they were kind of saying this is not a very PC thing to happen. It is not how we do things. We don't do things like this on a Sabbath day. You know, we do things in order. And this is how things should be. And you know, so many stories of Jesus is in interactions with people, both then and now, are not very PC. They're not how the world would do things, and they're not the sort of things that the world would say. But there's something irrepressible about what is in this man. And I want to encourage you to recognize the hand of God at work in your own life, and own your own story, and recognize that there's power in the story of interactions that you have with God. And it's meant to be owned and held onto and retold, because testimony means do it again. Repeat it, God. And even if it's the smallest thing, what we want to see is we want to see God doing those things again. And it has to be repeated. There's something about the man saying it out loud. He doesn't privately just go off, lead a nicer life now, now that he can see. He's kind of, you know, they cast him out too. That last little interaction that he has with Jesus, where Jesus sits with him and he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man says, show me so I can worship him. And he says, I'm, it's me. I'm with you now. The one that is sitting before you, that he sees with his own eyes and he worships him. He's cast out. You know, this is his reality, that from this point on, you know, he is a bit of an outcast because testimony can be a bit divisive. But... One of the things I I feel like, you know, God wants to say to us is have courage because you've got the whole kingdom of God within you. Hold to your story and tell your story. Repeat it so that God can do it again and again. A story of God validates itself. It doesn't need official recognition from anyone around you. And there are many people around the world who will tell the stories of God to their family and they will be shut out of their families. And we live live in a very kind of relatively easy setting in this culture, in this day and age, in this country. And we're free to share. And I just want to encourage you to be brave and share the stories of what God has been doing. So I thought I'd give you a little crib thing on how to tell your story. (laughs) Okay, so my first point was that, that transformation itself tells a story. You cannot deny this man's transformation that in itself is undeniable and transformation is part of your journey so God is calling you do not sit still come with me 
grow, change, come on the wholeness course, do something, because actually the stories of transformation are part of our testimony. It's not all about whether you can convince somebody through your conversion story. Transformation itself, healing, growing, learning, wisdom, being able, changing, getting rid of our addictions, becoming freer people, transformation tells a story. Second one then, let's, let's just go, go down through the slides. I just want to show you, tell the stories of healing. Now, I'm focusing a little bit on healing because I think healing is a bit of a crisis point. When somebody hears the story of a miraculous healing, it's very difficult to argue with it. And I want to encourage you as a congregation to go for healing not just healing, but prophecy and all the things that are part of the kingdom of God, the supernatural stuff. Not because they're the only things. You know, transformation and faithfulness and prayer and all those things are just as important. But there's something about when God comes in and invades our reality and shocks us out of our stupor <laughs> and actually starts to wake people up. You know, when you see a physical healing the other day in one of the social enterprises that Love Bristol, the charity that I was talking about, is part of. We've got one social enterprise called Happy Tat, play on the words Habitat. It's a second-hand furniture shop. And one of the guys, Pete, in there, has had a back, a back problem for eight years. And he fell down the stairs about eight years ago. And since then, he's had long seasons of pain, terrible pain. And once the pain would start, it would go for a couple of months, a long time. And he came in the other day, and he was in pain. And he knew that this was going to be a few weeks of being stuck in pain. And it's agony for him. He's somebody who picks up furniture and carries it around. So he came in looking grey, and a couple of people in the shop, Barney and Johnny, were like, what's the matter with you today? And he says, I've just, it's just started. The pain started. I know it's going to be like this for a long time. It's such, such agony. And they said, let's just pray, shall we? And they stood there in the shop and prayed. This was last week. And they just placed their hands on his back. And they just prayed, and they said, God, let your kingdom come. Bring your healing to Pete. Just like that, nothing complicated. And as they prayed, one of them, Johnny, felt a jolt go through his own body. <laughs> and as he felt it, Pete just suddenly straightened up and he's, he felt a pop in his back and he said, it's gone. And he moved all over the place and it was completely free. This was about 10 days ago, he's still totally fine. It's completely free of pain. He said he felt like he'd been inflated in that moment as that jolt went through Johnny. Now I tell you, it's very difficult to just put, you know, ignore that. It's a bit of a crisis in that moment. It's like something has invaded this reality and changed things. And we've got to sit up and take notice. And I want to encourage you as a congregation to, to actually be praying for healing. And I know it's not straightforward because it doesn't always happen. And we've got to wrestle with those things. But sometimes it does. And it's worth it when it does. So let's pray for healing. So, and tell the stories of healing. So this is a way to learn how to tell your story. So let's uh, go on two slides, I think. Next one. Here. Okay. This is your little helpful symbols for how to tell your story. So on wholeness, we often get people to tell their stories of transformation and healing because it really helps other people to see it in real life. And these are the, this is a helpful way to tell your story. So the first one is the butterfly. So the butterfly is the symbol of transformation. So the very first thing that's really important when you're telling a story is to recognize that you've got to be different. It actually means that transformation, that's the butterfly, is this idea that, you know, you're a living embodiment of your own story. So be different. Seek peace and joy and freedom. Seek those things because they're part of your story. Be different. The man running backwards, that's how did it used to be. What were the things that defined you before either an encounter with God or a healing or a prophetic word that has changed you or when you came to know, and the changeover when, when you came to know God? What were the things that you were stuck in? What were the things that were difficult? What were the things that set you on a search for God? It's good to have that as part of your story. Secondly, what stopped you in your tracks and began to make you think, actually, 
I've got to change my mind here. Something is changing. And that's the man just standing there still. What is it that stopped you in your tracks and made you think and made you start to realize there's more that is available? The light bulb moment, I always say to people, were there any light bulb moments? You know that moment when you suddenly realize something? Something is different to how you thought it was. God is a different being to the one you thought he was. Something is possible that you thought wasn't possible, a healing. God knows me in a way I didn't know he did because you've had a prophetic word. Those light bulb moments are absolutely keys to helping other people see because one of the things that you do when you share a light bulb moment is other people have them too. It's like ping, ping, oh, I get it. And that's something that we have recognized when we get seeing people tell the stories in wholeness, the light bulb moments. How is it gone, the man going forward, how is it now? How has it gone on for you? You know, how have things changed? It's really important to be able to say, actually, now I find that I've got peace. Even though my circumstances haven't changed, I've got peace. Or I know that I'm loved, or something like that. And I think always, we've got to direct our stories back into God's story and his love for people. You know, because your story is woven into God's amazing, huge story of his interaction with the world. So his love for people is part of your story. And that should be how you share your testimony, that I've realized that God has this love. So one day, I was doing prayer on the streets in Stokes Croft. And um, we had had, for a few weeks, a guy had been coming past called Mark. And every time he saw us, he stopped and he had a little argument with us. <laughs> because he was an atheist, and he was ardent in his atheism. <laughs> and he wanted to talk intellectually about what it all means and, you know, what's right and what's wrong. And, and he, he just, he wanted to argue. And so for six weeks, I personally had a little toing and froing with him. And, you know, on the good day, I quite like a little debate. <laughs> and I, might, I, I stood there chatting to him about this and that, and he kept on saying, I'm a scientist, and... Actually, I believe in this, and you can't prove that. And, you know, it went on for about six weeks. And one day he came along on the sixth week, and I just thought, oh, I can't do it again today. <laughs> I can't just get drawn into this thing. And after a couple of minutes of chatting to him, I just stopped and I said, do you know, Mark, I can't do this today. Let me just tell you that since I was a little girl, I have felt gripped by the love of God, a father in heaven who loved me. I'm telling you, it put something into me that was such a good foundation for my life. I wish everyone could have it. And he just stopped in his tracks and he stared at me and he said, I have wanted something like that all my life. And it was just, it just totally broke the kind of spell, if you like, of this debate, this intellectualism. And we had, I prayed with him that day. He came on an Alpha course. He became a Christian. You know, it was just, and it was just sharing my very simple, undramatic story. I felt gripped by the love of God since I was a child. So there, there you go. There's a little, little helpful hint. The butterfly, the looking backwards, what stopped you in your track, light bulb moments, how has it changed? Don't forget, weave it back into God's great story of his love for humanity. So... I've got loads of stories I could tell you, but I haven't actually got enough time. Story envy. Nowadays, I've got some stories that I could share of things that have happened in my life that actually are great to share. The other day, I was in the cafe that I was talking about earlier, and I was sitting down having a coffee with a friend, and another friend walked in unbeknownst to us and sat down on a table with a lady that she didn't know because there was nowhere else to sit. And she started chatting to her. I didn't even know this was going on. But suddenly, after about 15 minutes, she came and brought this lady over to me and my friend Sophie <laughs> and said, this is Eileen. She would like um, a spiritual reading. Could you do one <laughs> right now? <laughs> and uh, and we, we just went, okay. And she then went off and left her with us. So <laughs> thank you. Um, so we sat this lady down, and um, my friend Sophie, just f who um, is just you know happy to sort of pray and prophesy really quickly, just told her a few things that she felt God was saying to her. 
And while she was speaking, I had a couple of minutes to think, which was useful. And in front of me was, um, on the table, there was a hole, you know, like a knot hole where the wood has got pushed through in a piece of wood. And there was a hole there. And what came into my mind was this. I just thought, rabbit hole, Alice in Wonderland. And I thought, that's not very biblical. (laughs) Um, but it just, you know, it stayed in my mind, and I thought I felt there was a few things that I could share with this lady um, about that. It would be a good illustration of, you know, that there are two realities. Alison's in one, and there's another reality that when she wakes up in this other, she goes through the rabbit hole. She's in this other, and actually, she didn't know it until she was there. So I sort of had a few things that I was thinking. And anyway, so I said to her, well, while Sophie was speaking, I, my attention was drawn to this hole, and I thought it's a bit like the rabbit rabbit hole in Alice in Wonderland and she stopped me she put her hand on my shoulder and she said what why did you say that and I just (laughs) said because of the hole on the table and she said for the last three days I've been thinking my life is like Alice in Wonderland who's gone through the rabbit hole and then we proceeded to talk and I told her a few things that I felt God might be saying through it but you know that is such a great experience to be part of for me because it was really encouraging for me it was exciting and I think that should be normal for us you know we should have stories to tell and sometimes it means stepping out and taking some risks because actually you can't get a story if you're quiet and you stay you've got to be like the blind man that says I don't care I know I was blind and now I see so I want to encourage you to take a few risks and if you take some risks you'll tell some stories Because ultimately, the third point is that your story reveals God to the world. Like I was saying, you've got the kingdom of God inside you, and it's got to come out. Let the kingdom of God out. It's supposed to be leaking all over the place. Your story, however mild or exciting or somewhere in between, is a revelation to the world of what the kingdom of God looks like and what it looks like to walk in partnership with God. And... Bill Johnson, who I love listening to because he's very um, stirs your faith in, in the power of testimony, he says this. He says, our capacity to remember what God has said and done in our lives and throughout history, the testimony, is one of the primary things that determines our success or failure in sustaining a kingdom lifestyle of power for miracles. That's quite wordy. But what he's saying is, if you keep telling the stories then there's something faith-building and faith-stirring in telling our testimonies. And possibly it's one of the key ways of stirring faith and stirring up other people's faith. And if you keep it to yourself, somebody told me the other day that a year ago when I prayed for a healing for them, they'd been totally healed and they forgot to tell me. It's such a faith-building thing when that happens that somebody says to you, actually, when you gave me that prophetic word, It really changed things for me. So I want to encourage you, let the kingdom of God out. It is within you. Grow in the the the, the grow in healing, grow in the prophecies, grow in wisdom, the wisdom of the Spirit. Testimony means do it again. And that's our prayer, isn't it? It says in the book of Revelation, ultimately, at the end of all things, Satan himself will be overcome by two things. Who knows this scripture? They overcame him by what? The blood of the lamb lamb and? The word of the... How can those two things go alongside each other? The death of Jesus on the cross and my puny little testimony. How can that be? And yet somehow it is true to say that God has so woven us into his story. He's not trying to keep it for himself. He wants his story to be your story, to be their story. And that ultimately will be the overcoming of the powers that cruelly oppress our friends and family and our world. And your testimony is like a golden key that helps to unlock the kingdom of God for other people. So don't be mean (laughs) with your testimony. Share it, even if it's mild. Share it. And I want to challenge you to come to church with your testimony, ready to share, even if it's something tiny, what God has done in your life. This week, I'm challenging you, come early for the coffee time and share a testimony with somebody else in this time. Okay, so that's my challenge to you. I'm done. I've got a couple of things I want to pray for you.